Hello and welcome to the Football 365 Isolation Show. This episode is uh, winners and losers, but for the whole season. Uh, I'm Mark Smith, your host. I'm joined by Matt Stead. Matt Stead, deputy editor of Football 365 and Liverpool fan. So you'll be, I think, pretty chipper about this season review, won't you? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. More chipper than the weather. I think I'm probably top of the winners right now, so that's fine. Obviously, it'd be mental to start anywhere other than your team, Liverpool, wouldn't it? I think. I think in this one, we've got we've got Liverpool as the as the winners, but I think within that, you can also incorporate Jurgen Klopp, Player of the Year Jordan Henderson, and probably a couple of others. So you know what? Fire away, Matt. You've earned it. Yeah, I mean, we spoke about it before, haven't we? It's been a massive yes. team effort from Liverpool, more more so than probably any other champion in the in recent history. I know we've had like Man City winning it with De Bruyne, Chelsea with Hazard. But in terms of Liverpool, I know Henderson's obviously won the uh, footballer of the year, but you could pick any any number of those players to yes. there. I think he's really probably more I, I don't want to degrade him too much, but I think it's more the sentimental kind of aspect of it, which is fair. Yes. He's, he's I think it it feels team. like um he has. He has been he's been outstanding all season, but it does feel like um they never quite got to give it to Gerard as a Premier League winning captain and it feels like they've they've thought ah you know what this is our chance now to sort of lay that ghost to rest a little bit yeah, you're right. a little bit yeah and, and it feels like I think you, you're right I think it is probably a sentimental choice um, but you know that's the prerogative of the, of the football writers and we'll see if the, the PFA uh, agree I suspect they won't but that doesn't matter that wouldn't even take the, the, the varnish off this off this Liverpool side because it's not just Henderson is it talk us through some of the other outstanding contributors this season no, exactly. I mean, in terms of any other candidate, you could probably go for Sadio Mane, maybe Mo Salah. I know those two have probably they've scored more goals than anyone else for Liverpool. And they've been, I know Salah gets a lot of criticism for being greedy and stuff. But I think that's all. I think any any striker in that situation is going to be greedy. They're going to take shots when they should pass and stuff like that. You don't, but you want a greedy I striker. I want a striker to exactly. be greedy. It's not a criticism, is it? It's, it's crazy. No. I think in terms of you could drop even further back. Fabinho at the start of the season was absolutely immense. He was brilliant. Yep. Alexander Arnold's been good throughout. Van Dijk, obviously, and Alisson, they've been. They've had and their, Robertson. They've had a couple of moments. Yeah, Robertson. Is, you, you could have. I mean, it's basically eight, that. eight or nine of that team, isn't it? That, that you think could you you wouldn't be upset if they won it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the team of the year, basically, isn't it? With maybe De Bruyne chucked in and yep. Harry Maguire probably if you need a Man United player. Yeah, I think it probably would be. Um, uh, let's talk about the, the top man in charge, though, Jurgen Klopp. I mean, is it his fifth season or sixth season? He's been there five years, hasn't he? So he, he's uh, come in and he's... Is only, it's only fourth season? I think it's fourth full season, but obviously... Oh, right, in OK, October. yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, he, he seems to have revolutionised that, that side, doesn't he? And he seems to have gone under the radar a little bit in the last few weeks, probably because Liverpool have won it so comfortably, but... How far ahead is he of the rest of the league in terms of management? Or is he on a similar level to, to Pep? Or is he behind Pep? Where do, where do you see him fitting in in that hierarchy? Um, it's, it's difficult because in terms of Pep, obviously, if you judge it on this season, then Klopp's miles ahead. It's not even yeah. close. But obviously, City, they, they had their two seasons of being brilliant. They had a season where they finished up 100 points and they got 98 points. Liverpool are coming off the back of a 96-point season, I think it was, and they've just got 99 this season. So they've both had those two seasons of pretty much dominating the Premier League, whereas Klopp's kind of going into this third season. And there's every chance he will be able to do it. It's, it's a big ask, but there's every chance he'll be able to kind of replicate this. I suppose the question is whether Liverpool lose that hunger after finally winning the Premier League. Yes. That squad kind of drops off a little bit. I think it would be inevitable if they did. And I don't think it would be a criticism again. I think it's just natural for them to win the big one and then... You've, like I say, you've lost that hunger, you've lost that drive, you've lost yeah. that determination. And also, you, you can get into a situation where you, you, if you don't churn enough of your squad, I mean, Pochettino had this at Spurs, obviously a different level to Liverpool, of course. Liverpool have won everything. But the, the, the churn of a squad's important because we've mentioned there the front three, Salah, Mane, Firmino. They've been there for a couple of seasons, a few seasons now, and they are late 20s. They've won everything there is to win with Liverpool. Now I suppose we see how good Klopp is at motivating those players. We saw what Alex Ferguson was like year on year on year. Can Klopp do the same thing with this side or do they need to freshen it up a little bit? 
I think they do need to freshen up. I know they're obviously going to lose a couple of players in the summer. They're going to lose Lana. It looks like Shakiri might be on his way. So there'll be certain yeah. players in they're that They're bit squad. part players, aren't they? Exactly. That's the problem. It's, it's not the starting 11 that's freshening up. But then you look at it and you kind of, you wonder where they can bring someone on. Yeah. You wonder where they can kind of improve in that starting 11. And it would be yeah. difficult. But then you kind of, you take into account rotation and stuff like that. Like say that front three, it's pretty much unprecedented for three players to be that kind of strike force for three or four seasons in the Premier League. You've, you've, yeah. You can go back through however many seasons we've had and it's just, it's never happened before. And they've it all, exist. like you say, they're yeah. all, exactly, they're all, I think they're all 28. I think Firmino's the oldest and he turns 29 later this year. So they're all kind of in their theoretical peak years. Klopp's kind of, he's captured a lightning in a bottle a little bit, but you, you yeah, can't yeah. kind of, again, it's, it's not a case of degrading it at all. He's, he's timed it no. to perfection in terms of this season especially. It's been unbelievable. Um, so from Jurgen Klopp, we'll go to some more winners and some more managers. Chris Wilder's absolutely got to be in with a shout of being in this winners category, hasn't he? I think what, what he's done this season, had, had Liverpool not won it by such a distance, I would say Wilder would have to be manager of the year. Yeah, I think in terms of, if you're going to judge it based on overachievement and if you're going to judge it based on kind of pre-season predictions and expectations and stuff, I think Wilder is by far away the manager of the year. But in terms of, like you say, if you have to take Klopp into account, it is difficult to kind of make that yeah. case for him. But I, what I love about Wilder is that he kind of, he, he feels like he belongs in the Premier League. Obviously, he's spent pretty much all of his professional career as a player and as a manager in the lower leagues. Yeah. This is his first season of any kind in the top division. And he just he just looks completely at home. He's not at all out of his depth. He's innovated tactically and stuff like that. He's beaten bigger teams. Obviously, the kind of, Sheffield United kind of dropped off late in the season and they struggled against Liverpool and Man City, but any team would. And they've, they've been knows, aside yeah. from that. Exactly. And if you kind of look at it and you think they're disappointed not to qualify for Europe, that puts into perspective just how brilliant a job he's done. Yeah, and it's also very telling the way that the um, perceived top managers talk about him. And the way you hear Klopp and, and Jose and Pep, they all are just gushing about Chris Wilder. And it's not just his, you know, his overlapping centre backs that we've all raved about. It's his general style of play, and it's it's the way that he's brought through um, a number of players to to buy into his system and to take it from Championship to Premier League is a very difficult thing to ask. But he's done it, and he's done it beautifully, and they're a pleasure to watch. And yet, there's still teams that don't know how to play against him. Yeah, we saw uh, recently with the Chelsea game where, where Sheffield United, I think it was three 0 Chelsea just did not know what to do with him. And with his team, and I think that's a huge testament to them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think the the other thing I like about Wilder is that he's he's got so much faith, like you say, in his tactics and in his approach and stuff. That if Sheffield United lose or if they don't play to the standard he expects, that's on the players, and the players know that. That's that's a case of application. That's not a case of anything to do with the way the managers approached it or anything like that. He's got so yeah. much faith in how he and how he approaches games and how he does things. And he's earned that faith. He's, he's done it all the way through the leagues with Northampton, with Sheffield United, obviously now, with, with everyone else he beat. He's absolutely earned that kind of respect in terms of what he does. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another manager that you've actually selected in your, um, in your article on this, on football365.com, you've not gone with Oli, you've gone with Frank Lampard as uh, one of the winners. Why Frank? I've not gone with Ollie now, which is a, a very popular decision. Um, in, in terms of, it's not anything against Solskjaer. It's just a case of, I think I don't think Man United get Champions League football without Bruno Fernandes. It's simple as that, real. Well, maybe we'll um, talk about him in a second. So, hold, hold yeah, fire, for Christ's sake. Because you did ask about Frank Lampard and I just started talking about Bruno <laughs> yeah. Fernandes. Yeah, in, in terms of, it, with Lampard, I think it, we've spoken before about it was absolutely crucial for him to get Champions League football because Chelsea are unique in the way that they've obviously had last summer, couldn't spend any money. They got to January, they kind of, it looked like they needed something, they needed some sort of impetus, they needed some sort of defensive improvement, but they still did nothing. And then it got to, I think it was February, March time, they brought Zayac in, um, just before the end of this season, yeah. they brought Werner in. So they've been kind of going through this season and still building towards next season while they're playing this one with the uncertainty of what, where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing. Yeah. So I think Lampard, and he's taken a lot of flack, but also he's he's been given a lot of free passes. I think from certain sections of the media and the fan base this season. But I think in terms of, I think he'll know deep down 
that that defence needs improving. That's absolutely a given. And that's, that, par- that that's paramount, is, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Ed. I mean, they've, they've sorted out. I think they've probably gone a bit too overboard, to be honest, with the attacking stuff. I think they've, yeah, because that hasn't so been an issue. No, not at all. They've, they've been good this season with the players he inherited, and then they've added a couple more on top of that. Yeah. They still have to buy Havertz and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas yeah. you kind of look at it and you think maybe need another midfielder. They, may, they, they, they need pretty much a, maybe an entirely new defence, if not squad options in that area, yeah, and they definitely sure. need a new goalkeeper. I'd say. Yeah, definitely. And also, it's important to remember this is this is Lampard's second ever season as a football manager. I mean, he is a, an infant. He's a toddler in terms of in terms of Premier League managers, isn't he? I mean, this is, is it not ridiculous to expect any more than what he's delivered, given how fresh he is to this role? It is, yeah. It's, it's that same thing where at the start of the season, if you just said Chelsea are going to be finishing the top four, they're going to get to the FA Cup final, they're going to yeah. get through to the Champions League knockout stages, you'd, you wouldn't believe it at all. 100%. They, they, yeah. they, they had a decent squad, but as you say with Lampard, it's his second season of management, his first season... He showed kind of glimpses of good management at Derby, but then I'm sure you'll know only too well that kind of um, they, they bottle it towards the end, I'm sure. Didn't bottle it. No, didn't bottle it. Oh, it's not it, just... It's hey, look, not. and this, this goes out to everybody. There's not just... When a game of football is played, it's not that one team wins and the other team bottles it. You can lose a game of football without bottling it. Lampard didn't bottle it at, at Derby. We just weren't quite good enough. So shut up. Um, actually, let's move on to that because... Because in that in that game that we bottled last season against Aston Villa, well, Villa went up and it looked three weeks ago like they were toast, or like we'll come back down to my division again. But no, Villa and particularly Jack Grealish, as a result of this weekend just passed, they've got to be in the winners section, haven't they? Absolutely, Aaron. Yeah. It's it's that same thing where you kind of, I think we probably looked at it at the start of Project Restart and we thought Villa are a bit too far away here. They had a I think they had a couple of decent results at the start. They got, obviously, um, that draw against Sheffield United, I think it was, where the yep. where it actually crossed the line, but they didn't get it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, they kind of, at various stages throughout this season, you've kind of written them off. And they've yes. looked, it's looked like it's been completely beyond them. It's looked like the defence needs sorting. It's looked like they're not scoring enough goals. They've got the creativity there in terms of relation and stuff, but they've just not had that kind of... Well, they also looked, they looked a bit broken, I thought. For about a month or two, they just looked like they had been... They were just defeated. Just spirit had disappeared out of that squad. And so for them yeah, to come back, it, it's fantastic. Yeah, they looked like they were completely resigned to their fate. And to yeah. be honest, I, I don't really blame them. Because they, they got, to be fair, they had a decent little run at the start of the year where they got to the League Cup final. And it kind of thought... It kind of felt, sorry, like they might use that to propel them to safety. But it never came to yeah. fruition. And then in the end, they've, just, they've stayed in touch just long enough to kind of time it. These last four games, getting eight points from them, just to time that perfectly to just on the last day, or even just before the last day, to get past Watford. Yeah, and special mention for Grealish. I mean, I, I mentioned him just then, but uh, I mean, even if you don't like him or don't like Villa or whatever, you, you have to just, I mean, this is the romance of football, isn't it? Local lad, done good, stayed with the club. He's their talisman. He's their captain. He scores the goal that puts them... I know they concede soon after, but he scores the goal that, to all intents and purposes, keeps them up. I mean, he, he is the guy you want. He, he is, for me, a high-pressure player. He's someone that, even in the dog days, when they were getting destroyed 2 3 nil down, he would still take the ball. He'd still search for the ball, take it in tight areas. He'd always want it. He'd always be available. He never hides. And that's exactly what you want, isn't it? What, what a genuinely an inspirational player for Villa to have. And whether he's there or not next season, that's, that doesn't matter for now. Let's just enjoy the fact that he's done something that he'd have dreamt about as a, as a child. Yeah, it's been... Uh, I think he'd probably hope for a better season, obviously, in terms of the whole club itself. Of course. I, I think Villa were, were aiming much higher, and I don't think you can call it much more than a, a qualified success to avoid relegation. But in terms of Grealish, like you say, I, I, I don't think the goal had much material effect on the actual table and stuff like that. But it was very Dennis Law back yes. heel relegating Manchester United in the 70s, I think it was. But even then, it, it's that kind of moment, isn't it? It's, it's the culmination of the entire season, all the effort that they've put towards it. And Grealish, yeah. I think there's the stat around that he's been the most foul player in, in a single Premier League season. Oh, by like, by like 80 fouls as well. It's not even close. Yeah, exactly. It's not even close. To here, which kind of, it goes to show that, I mean, there's an element of diving in there. He I know hits the deck a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why I might go to United, like, you see. 
exactly. Yeah, that is it. Manchester United. <laughs> Well, it's 11 a.m. now on Monday morning, so I imagine Grealish is still out with Dean Smith having a, having a bit of a large one. And fair play to him. Uh, let's move on, though. Um, we mentioned him earlier on as well, Bruno. I mean, he'd be the guy taking penalties if Grealish goes to United and continues to hit the deck. But we've only got about a minute on this. But if you can just talk to me about Bruno and, and how transformative he's been for United. Yeah, he, he's, he's completely changed their season. As I say... I think it was the game before he signed, the last game, the last Premier League game, sorry, before he signed was Burnley winning 2 0 at Old Trafford. Yes. And United just looked completely bereft of ideas. They looked completely lost. They looked unfit. They looked absolutely terrible. They were completely outplayed by Burnley. And I think after that game, Solskjaer kind of, it was the first real time that he'd admitted that they need something. They need something else. They need something from outside. And I think it was eight days after that they brought Fernandez in. And since then, they've not lost a single Premier League game. Yeah. He's, I think he scored eight goals and assisted seven or something like that. Obviously, a lot of penalties, but even then, it's like... They still count. Yeah, exactly. And the last game Pressure of the season penalties. against Leicester. Yeah, if he misses that penalty, the momentum with Leicester, Leicester could easily win that game. So, it's, it's yeah. not a given that he's going to score. But he's just completely... We've spoken about it before, and I know Sarah has as well. He's just completely... Oh, Sarah's obsessed with him. Yes, yeah, she, she really Sarah is. Sarah brings it's, him up quicker than you do. Sarah just, yeah. It's, yeah, it's borderline worrying, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He, he just completely changed the entire kind of culture and mentality around the club and if, if they can build on that and if they can sign players of a similar ilk and a similar kind of dedication yeah. and determination then they'll be in a good place you know Right, let's move on to losers. We've not got much time for this, which I'm quite happy with, because let's keep it positive on Football 365 with lots of chat about winners and only a bit about losers. Uh, but Man City, uh, having had such a terrific season last season, uh, their usual stand- standards seem to have slipped this time round. Uh, are you blaming Man City as a whole there, or are you blaming Pep? I think it's probably a case of both, isn't it? And again, it's that inevitability in terms of they've had two absolutely brilliant seasons and that third season. You can't possibly keep that standard up. I don't. No team's really ever done that over the course of three seasons. I know United have won three in a row before, but it's the points total still dwindles. The yes. the rivals still they keep improving. Whereas you, if you don't do anything, your kind of standards still are going backwards. Yeah. Whereas City kind of they have struggled in defence, particularly this season. I know it's it's always been a bit of a question for them, but I know Guardiola will. And I know he'll be called a checkbook manager as well, but it's a case of Liverpool had to spend money to get Van Dijk and Allison in, and that completely changed them yes. defensively. And I think City, I know they brought Edison in, and I know they brought Laporte in, but they need they need more than that basically, and they need a yeah. good. They need a partner for Laporte, don't they? Yeah, exactly. They need they, they need they're going to have to replace a few players. Obviously, David Silva's going. I know Phil Foden's coming in. Aguero might be coming to the end of that time. So there's there's a there's a case of a few players coming to the end of an era and they're going to have to kind of rebuild that spine a little bit more, I think. Yeah, I think so. But, I mean, watch out next season because the way they've started in the restart has been pretty worrying, I'd say. I mean, just scoring goals for fun and they're doing what they did at Barcelona, which is if you don't trust your defence that much, then just don't let them get near the ball and just keep it up top and keep scoring goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I, I was, I've just been looking, actually. I've, just, I've been stunned by the fact that they scored 102 goals this season. Since the restart, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> against Norwich, they've got the um, the fourth best goal difference in Premier League history. Which, when you consider, <laughs> really? exactly, when you consider the actual season they've had, it's absolutely astounding. Yeah. So there's there's a few little tweaks, but they're they're not that far off. I know it feels it feels like a massive gap because Liverpool have been yeah. that good, but they're not really that far off. I don't all it takes is a little 1% drop from Liverpool and a little 1% raise from the others and it could be tight next season. Uh, right, more losers. Uh, Bournemouth have finally gone down. Fifth season in the Premier League. Um, Eddie Howe has made your list here. Uh, why Eddie Howe? It's, it's, it's been a tough season for his reputation, I think, because Bournemouth, they've been on an upward trajectory for so long and so has he in terms of he's been kind of going up and up through the leagues with them, even in the first Premier League season, I think they finished ninth. And he was being billed for the England job, the Arsenal job, the Spurs yep. job. I think he was on Liverpool's shortlist when they got rid of Rodgers. Whereas you kind of look at it now and you'd say, if any of those clubs got rid of their managers or if Southgate left England, he'd probably still be in the running, but I think before he'd have been a favourite for those jobs. Yeah. 
yeah, interesting to see what he does next. Uh, I mean, what what's uh, sort of struck me uh, is this disconnect between Bournemouth being this plucky little family club that don't spend much money and the actual figures because their net spend over the last five years has been higher than Spurs. I saw this morning, Jefferson Lerma was £25 million. You yeah. know, Solanke, I already knew this, was £19 million. Jordan Ibe was similar sort of fee. I mean, this isn't, this isn't sort of chump change, is it? This is serious money that's being outlaid on players. So is it, is it a question of uh, Bournemouth scouting isn't good enough, or is it that Eddie Howe's final decision and his, his final say, which we all assume he has on players, isn't quite right? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to say. Obviously, not within the club and within the structure, but there is there's a case where I think they've cut, they've been in the Premier League for so long where they've acted like they think a Premier League club should act in terms of right. they've seen Liverpool do so well. They've thought, right, let's get a couple of their squad casts off and stuff like that. Obviously, they brought like you say they brought Lerma in. They've kind of they've experimented in terms of the continental side of it. He's been a decent player for them, to be fair, but nowhere near enough to kind of not enough, play. yeah. Um, and then they've kind of they've shopped in the lower leagues a little bit more with Lloyd Kelly and players like that, where I, I think a lot more, and it is difficult to kind of judge managers based on the transfers, but a lot more of how's dealings have been misses than hits. Yes. Yeah, and also, I, I mean, I'm hoping that they haven't been arrogant enough as a club to assume that they are deserving of Premier League every season, because otherwise they could be left with a lot of players here on big money they don't have any relegation clauses in their contract. Um, so, fingers crossed. I do like Bournemouth. It's a, it is a, it's a good club. And I do like Eddie Howe. And I hope they bounce back, but not at the expense of Derby, crucially. Right, finally, um, give us 45 seconds, Matt, on uh, Watford and why they are in our losers category for this season. They got relegated, Mark. All right. OK, well, thanks very much, Matt Stead. Uh, if you want to get in touch with the show uh, get us at uh, the editor at football365.com uh, I think we're back next week after the FA Cup final uh, we'll see if we're not then you know we've been cancelled um, right I've been Mark Smith that's been Matt Stead thanks very much until next time goodbye goodbye <laughs>